Good morning, everybody. Uh, Father John Wilson here. It's uh, Saturday, May 2nd. Uh, we are continuing our, our study of the life of a uh, servant of God, Mary Teresa Tallon, uh, someone I've become uh, especially devoted to in, in recent months. Um, so we, we, were, we were talking yesterday about, um, about her, her religious vows, poverty, chastity, and, and obedience, and how she, she viewed these vows as the easy way to heaven. Uh, but the easy way to heaven does not mean a, a life of ease. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, because giving yourself to Jesus Christ in that way um, means taking up the cross daily. And so um, what you have in you know, all of these uh, religious communities is, um, you know, especially those who aren't cloistered, who aren't, who don't have a, a specific apostolate of uh, hidden prayer. Um, what you would have instead is um, a, a, a strenuous life of apostolic labor. Um, you know, loving our Lord Jesus Christ means loving your neighbor. Um, and... Uh, yeah, these these ladies worked hard, um, and Mother Mary Teresa Tallon, or as she was known at the time, Sister John Birchman's, um, her congregation, the uh, the Sisters of the Holy Cross, they were a teaching order, um, and and she got her her first uh, taste of this this work uh, pretty soon after her arrival in the convent. You know, she was a novice for for six years, um, but you know she and this was at uh, at Notre Dame, uh, University of Notre Dame in Indiana. So like, she was actually got experience as kind of a, an assistant teacher in the prep school of the university, and very specifically in the, like, the primary school uh, department. Um, and uh, she, she took to the work very quickly um, through both serious study and, um, and again, a life of charity. Uh, this made her a, a really, really good teacher um and you know she had one experience very early on that kind of um foreshadowed the the things that would start growing in her soul uh later um so she one of her assignments as, as a young novice was to oversee the detention hall and this was you know the boys who got in trouble or didn't do their work well enough um you know the, the, the detention hall ran you know, for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, all day during the free days, and she was the one who was just sitting there as they were doing their their assignments, and um, you know, she kind of saw the the ineffectiveness of of that of that uh, arrangement, um, sort of the boys' restlessness and how this you know the, this wasn't really feeding their souls, right? Um, and so she like she wanted to. Her heart went out to them. She wanted to, to talk to them, to teach them, to encourage them. Um, she was under obedience to kind of stay quiet and just supervise their quiet work. But um, she certainly, you know, prayed for them, you know, day in, day out, five years. And, and let, um, certainly let the desire for their good really grow in her heart. Um we see in her early teaching career part of what um, the vow of obedience means. Um, after she made her final vows in 1893, she starts teaching like full time. Um, and she's a full member of a faculty at a, a different school in South Bend, Indiana. And then like after six months, she's yanked. They need to teach her somewhere else, kind of crisis situation. Um, uh, another, another town in Indiana. And then at the end of that school year, like like literally the day after the school year ends, she's summoned back to the mother house and said, actually, you know, we're, we need you to go to San Francisco. We're, we're opening up a school there, so, uh, you know, and have your trunks packed tomorrow. Uh, so you, you see really what the vow of, be, of obedience could mean uh, practically. Uh, but it's in, in San, San Francisco where she spends about 10 years that her her apostolate of teaching really starts to flourish. Um, and this is where I could, I, I really want to learn more about 
and not just the, the history of the, the church in the United States in general, but about um, like what, what these uh, Catholic schools were really like. Because, uh, you know, the sense I, I get from reading uh, her life is a little bit different than kind of like the, the, the stereotypical maybe Bells of St. Mary's image we might have of like old school Catholic schools, right? You know, we think of these as very kind of very well-run, ordered, kind of like mainstays of a, of a Catholic culture. Um, her, her life teachings has a bit more of a Wild West quality to it. Um, and actually, if, if you look at just basic history of religious observance in, um, in the United States, you know, the, the 1950s, uh, where, you know, I don't know, our kind of our mental image of like Catholic culture golden years, maybe, um, were a much more religiously observant time than say the, the 1920s or the 1890s when um, Sister John Birchman's really starts teaching. Um, the, the Catholic, Catholic piety in many senses wasn't as strong as it, as it became. Uh, and this can be a challenge for us who like are living in 2020 and see only a, a period of like growing secularity and, and decline in, in uh, religious observance in our country. You know, like, no, like the, those golden years, they were built. They were built by, uh, by the grace of God and, and through the hard work of a lot of people uh, like Sister John Birchman's. Uh, and and we, we see her her very, very fruitful labor almost right away when she gets to San Francisco. Um, it's a brand new school, and she's got, like, the worst boys in the world. She's got, like, 12 middle schoolers. You know, almost all of them are, like, behind. They haven't been going to school regularly at all. They're, like, outcasts from, from the public school. And the rest of the, the kids on her roster, like, simply aren't there. Um, and so, like, she, there's, there's real hard work to be done, uh, winning over the boys, winning over their parents. Um, and, but she does. And, and she, she has a real genius for, for winning their trust. And, and it's, it's more than just the, um, like, I, like, and I, I think they're, that was a function of her holiness, of her devotion to, to Jesus Christ. Like you, you, you've got to really show that you desire their good, and you've got to show that you know in what their good consists. And she really tried, you know, even, even then she was kind of fighting out against an institutionalist mentality, just like and get these boys in the door, get them out the door, get them, uh, you know, you know, she wanted to speak to their souls and to to establish a, a connection that would, would show them the, the worthiness of a life devoted to God. And because they could see that in her and they could see that how much she desired their good and how much she loved Jesus Christ, uh, they, they really they took to the things of God in a beautiful way. You know, they were capable of this uh, by his grace. And, and again, um, one of the, the great blessings she had, and we see that we saw this in her early life, was that, you know, she was able to present the faith as something solid, something worth shaping your life around. Um, she, uh, she had a lot of success uh, actually in um, uh, training these boys to uh, to serve the mass uh, that was one of her uh, very uh, very successful after school apostolates you know training up this this like core of, of altar boys and, and teaching them to love the, the the greatest mysteries of our faith the things of God uh, this this had a real impact she she was raising saints and so she she's in San Francisco she reminds me actually um, of someone who, who of uh, Saint John Bosco, uh, who was doing a lot of this same work in Italy, and who actually died 
1888, the, the year after she entered the novitiate. Um, so she's doing this work in San Francisco. She's there for 10 years. Uh, in 1904, she, there's an outbreak of dip, diphtheria. She gets real sick. She's recovering for like the better part of a year um, back in the mother house. Um, she is um, sent very briefly to a school in Maryland. And then uh, summer 1905 is sent to, uh, to teach at a school in New York City. And that's when the, the story really starts to pick up, where she starts to um, discover her, her call within a call that would, um, that would eventually come um, to fruition in the foundation of the, the parish visitors of Mary Immaculate. We'll talk about all that stuff soon. God bless.